Good afternoon, everyone. It is Wednesday, February the 12th, 2020. It is currently 12.33 p.m. Central Time. Well, this is Understanding Difficult Bible Passages, Part 4. Understanding Difficult Bible Passages, Part 4. Yes, we started this on Sunday at Victory Baptist Church. We have continued Throughout the week, we're going to go all the way till Friday dealing with the subject of understanding difficult Bible passages. I hope you've learned something. I hope you've been challenged to think. And I hope that when I'm telling you to look some things up or to work on some things, I hope you're doing that as well because what you're going to get out of this podcast is, well, is greatly determined what you're going to put into this, all right? Because this is a situation that we're try- I'm trying to help you, the listener, Develop skills in how to handle a difficult Bible passage, how to understand it, all right? So let me remind you of where we have been, and then we're going to advance this and move forward, all right? On Friday of last week, I got an email from the Discover the Word podcast. I listened to the Discover the Word podcast, and on Fridays, they always send out an email saying, hey, this is what we're going to be covering in the coming week. All right. In the coming weeks, starting on Monday, here's what we're going to be talking about. And in the email, this is what I found. This is what I read. Have you struggled with some of the things you find in the Bible? There are situations in Scripture that are hard to comprehend in today's context. The book of Ezra contains a perfect example of a difficult passage that can sound cruel and unchristlike to us. In Ezra chapter 10, Ezra prayed about cross-cultural marriages and instructed the men to get rid of their wives and children. Why? This week, we're back to basics as the Discover the Word team explores the question, how do we read what we don't understand in the Old Testament? All right. So that once I saw that, I was like, okay, this this is good. So I went to church on Sunday and during the first hour at Victory Baptist Church, we spent like one hour and eight minutes looking at Ezra chapter 10 and Ezra chapter nine. We looked at it. We we went at it from the perspective that maybe this is a God ordained their, their, their solution because what had happened is they committed sin. They had married women who were pagans. Now they had to fix this problem. And, and so we went at it from the perspective, God ordained their solution to put away the wives. We went back to chapter 9 to figure out why this was so serious. We think we figured that out. We went to chapter 10. We we added some context there. And I think we did a, a fairly good job. Then on Monday, we started listening to the Discover the Word podcast. Now, Monday, they didn't say a lot. They really just kind of explained, hey, here's this problem in the text. The text seems to be you know, they're, they're, the text is telling these people to put away their wives. This seems to go against the idea of the importance and sanctity of the family, of marriage. Uh, this is a horrible situation. On Tuesday, yesterday, they, they tried to get, they offered uh, uh, some solutions. Um, they, they went with the idea that in Ezra chapter 10, it wasn't God giving them this solution, that they came up with this idea. And uh, we talked about that. They, this comes from Ezra, I think, chapter 10, verse 3, where it uses the word Lord, but with a lowercase l, um, even though that's the Hebrew word Adonai. We, we could get into all of this, the, the, the discussion there. You can go back and listen. Uh, but we, we talked about that. We, we considered the possibility that maybe they're right, that, that it wasn't God giving them uh, this, this idea, but then does God agree with it? Does God approve of it? So we asked a lot of questions. Um, I'm not going to go back to all of those. Again, I would challenge you to go back and listen to Understanding Difficult Bible Passages, Part 1, Part 2, and Part 3. Here we are in Part 4. So instead of looking back, let's move forward. Let's just jump right in. Let's start listening to the Discover the Word podcast for today. And, uh, well, I'll jump in and offer thoughts, uh, challenges, and let's let's see what we can learn uh, not only about Ezra 10, but how do we handle difficult Bible passages? Or as they as they put it, how do we read what we don't understand in the Old Testament? Here we go, the Discover the Word podcast for today. Mm-hmm. 
This week on Discover the Word, the group is exploring together with you some helpful things to keep in mind when reading the Old Testament. Because there are quite a few things in the Old Testament that raise some real questions in our minds. Not just things that we feel like we don't understand, but things we think we do understand and we are troubled by them. Such is the case in the passage in the book of Ezra that we're focusing on. But today, group member Bill Crowder gives us an important idea to keep in mind when we are reading the Old Testament. Sometimes the Bible is prescriptive, and sometimes the Bible is descriptive. Hmm. So when we look at a text like this, we can ask ourselves, okay, is this a text where the Bible is describing something that happened? Mm -hmm. Or is it telling us what to do? Which does this land under? Hi, and welcome to Discover the Word, the weekday small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries with your study partners, Mark Hahn and Elisa Morgan and Bill Crowder and Daniel Ryan Day. And as I mentioned, Bill is leading the conversations this week about reading the Old Testament. And what we hope this week accomplishes is twofold, really. First of all, we hope you'll have a clearer understanding of a difficult passage in Ezra, where the spiritual leaders of Israel advise the people to divorce their wives and abandon their children. That is an example of a troubling Old Testament passage that we're trying to come to grips with. And then the second goal we have this week is to enable you to have some tools in your Bible reading toolbox that you can use when you run into other difficult parts of the Old Testament because, you know, they are there. And so remember, if you miss any parts of this week, the uh, audio of each day is on our discovertheword.org website. Just look for the Reading the Old Testament graphic. All right, well, let's join the group now for day three of this week's study. I was recently speaking at a pastor's conference, and there were three of us who were the lead speakers. And at the end, they asked for a question and answer session. And one of them asked each of us to respond to the question, what are the biggest issues facing the church today? That's not an easy one. That's really a kind of a big question. That is a big question. (laughs) And uh, one of the answers, not mine, but one of the answers that I thought was totally brilliant was the church today needing to own our responsibility to be like Jesus in caring for the poor. Hmm. Yeah, Um, that's good. Because here in North America, we tend to be a lot more concerned about the poor in third world countries than we do the poor around the corner. Ignore our own. And Mm -hmm. far more concerned about our own Mm -hmm. morality and right thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And my response, which really may have something to do with what we're talking about this week, was one, I think, we need to learn how to read the Bible. Mm-hmm. And two, we have a great need for theological humility. Mm-hmm. We tend Now I have to step in here. When he says one of the biggest challenges facing the church is we have to learn how to read the Bible. Now I agree with that in principle, yes, We have to learn how to read, but let me make this very clear. We have to learn how to study the Bible. See, if you just read it, I I get over here, I pick up my Bible, Ezra chapter 10. And now when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for people wept very sore. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such are as born of them according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. All right, stop right there. All right, I've read it. Now, I may stop for a second and go, wow, that's hard to understand. Well, you know, that's probably for back then, doesn't really apply for today. Okay, I'm going to move on. All right, that, that's, to me, that's the problem. It's not learning how to read it. It's learning how to study it. Reading does not equate to study. Reading is simply reading. At some point, you've got to stop the reading and start the studying of the text. You've got to observe it. You've got to work to interpret it. 
You've got to work to apply it. Now, I know he probably he probably means that as well, but I'm just saying, just learning to read, reading the Bible requires at some point to move from reading to now sitting down and working on doing an actual study, writing down observations, learning how to look up, I mean, using a basic, one of the basic Bible study methods, whether it's the chapter summary method, whether it's a word study method, a biographical method, uh, a thematic method, a topical method. I mean, there's there's like 12, at least a minimum of 12 major uh, methods of Bible study, utilizing one of those. Now, so I, now I do understand, I do, un- let me make it very clear, I do understand that he he probably means this, but I just think sometimes you know, when you talk to Christians about how they study the Bible, it's kind of like I read it and then you know I think about it. I may underline something, I may highlight something, I may look something else up. I'm like, well, that's not really Bible study. And here's, can you understand the Bible by just simply reading it? And I will say you can't. I can't figure out Ezra 10 verses 1 through 3 just by reading that. I'm going to have to stop. I'm going to have to start figuring out context. I'm going to, I'm possibly going to have to pick up some background information to the book of Ezra, to Ezra, to what was going on at the time. I'm going, I'm going, it's going to re- require a lot of things. So just saying we need to learn how to read it. Okay. And then theological humility. Well, I don't want to get off subject here. We're dealing, we're dealing with Bible difficulties. We're dealing with Bible difficulties. So, uh, yes, we do we need to re- learn how to read better? Yes, but that reading, listen, reading alone is not sufficient. Requires st- too many times Christians say, I read the Bible, I don't study the Bible. Then, then what are you accomplishing in the reading? <laughs> what? You just you read it? Congratulations. You're gonna have to study that to under have any idea what it means, or you're going to walk away with a wrong understanding because you just read it and you just you, you, and your mind, you just gave it a meaning. In your mind, you gave it an interpretation without doing any of the work that is required to actually interpret the Bible. So that, that's my two cents here, but we, we want to see where they're going with this. So let's listen. Here we go. To be dogmatic where dogmatism is not really available. <laughs> and <laughs> that's the humility part. Mm-hmm. Or appropriate. Yeah. What I hear is we lay our understanding our culture, our times, our worldview on yeah. top of scripture and force it into mm-hmm. what we think it should be saying. Yeah, and we bring years and years for some of us of hearing the Bible taught, hearing different ideas that may or may not actually be in scripture. Yeah. So we bring a lot of spiritual baggage as well as cultural baggage to when we read the scriptures. Right. And if we're doing this in our own group, we do it without being aware that it might be appropriate to question our assumptions, you know, yeah. to question whether point. or not, you know, a little bit of imagination would allow us to see this through other people's eyes yep. and to see it very differently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It takes humility to pull ourselves out of our sense of almost merited rightness. To, that we've to, earned the... We've earned the right to be right. Yeah. And therefore, everybody else needs to come on board with mm-hmm. us. I like that concept of theological humility. I've heard it coined a generous orthodoxy as Mm -hmm. well, where we, Mm -hmm. with open hands, hold loosely to the Mm non-essentials. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as we think about that, there is a caution, because that doesn't mean anything goes. Right. That there's nothing important that needs to be held close. Now, I got to stop right here. Um, I got an email this morning dealing with this subject of unity and the non-essentials. The unity and the non-essentials. What does that, what are the non-essentials? Who who gets to determine what the non-essentials are? Is baptism an essential or is it a non-essential? Is the Lord's Supper an essential or non-essential? Right? Your, your view on inspiration, essential or non-essential? Your view on sanctification, essential or non-essential? Your view, you know, what's essential? Who gets, who, who come, who came up with the list? Because I know it's, I think the, I think the quote is sometimes attributed to Augustine. I think it actually comes from a, a, a Lutheran um, later on in, in church history. If I remember my church history, this is just top of my head, but it's something about, you know, um, what, what uh, you know, uh, how does, let me see, in fact, let me see if I can pull up the email. Because if I can pull up the email, then, uh, I can give you the exact statement that they're alluding to right here. Give me one second. This is impromptu, I know. (laughs) 
Okay, uh, uh, in in essentials unity. All right. Uh, the uh, this is how the email begins. The ev- evangelical philosophy is often stated by uh, this this saying: in essentials unity, and non essentials liberty, and all things charity. All right. Um, this I, I think it's commonly attributed to Augustine, but I think it comes from I don't know if I, how to his name was it Rupertus. Maldinius, I think. I think it's Rupertus Maldinius. I think that's his name. Maybe he was named. Maybe he had a different name. I don't know. I'm almost positive that's where they were, the, the phrase comes from. But uh, and if it came from a, a Lutheran, you're talking around 17th century. So you got you know 17 centuries of of, of basically church history, um, and then all of a sudden someone comes along in essentials unity and non-essentials liberty, and all things charity. Okay, well, what are the non-essentials? What are the essentials? What are the non, you know, what are the non-essentials? Hey, you know, in, in, you know, in these, in these non-essentials, in these non-essentials, we just have liberty, and, and we, we, we all, you know, we can, get, we can get along, because, because these non-essentials aren't, who, who gets to determine what is essential, and who gets to determine what is non-essential? That that to me is 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 a an important question because I think I think that I think what we do is people take liberty and say, hey, we're gonna get a, we're gonna work with this group, we're gonna work with this group, um, and we're gonna set aside essentials. We're gonna set or we're gonna label everything as a non-essential, so therefore we're gonna have liberty. Um here in West Texas, I think it's usually I think it's in the fall. I don't know when they do it, but they do this big evangel evangelistic outreach at Shotwell Stadium, and all the churches come together: Methodist, Church of Christ, Baptist. They all come together for evangelism. I'm like, well, wait a minute. To come together is that unity in the essentials? Is or, or did you just say everything is a non-essential, and then you reduce the essential to we believe that people need Jesus, so we are we're unified in, in the one essential. And everything else we said is a non-essential. Therefore, we have we we give liberty. I, I I don't know how I don't really understand this philosophy because it sounds so good. It does sound so oh, it sounds so sweet, so wonderful. Yes, you know we, we're we're going to be unified in the essentials and we're going to give liberty and grace in the non-essentials. That sounds so good. But wait a minute, are we are we truly unified in the essentials and who gets to determine what the essentials are and who gets to determine what the non-essentials are who who makes the list who is the authority because you can get 10 Christians together and I guarantee you we're going to get I think the Lord's supper is an absolute I think that's an essential in how we practice it I I don't think you just have liberty well you you practice open communion no I believe in closed communion I believe that the, the text of scripture would demand it because you had people in the church of Corinth who were dying by partaking of the Lord's supper incorrectly so how could you just hand it out to anybody I I think I I would call for fencing the table using a term in church history but I think that's pretty essential because you're dealing with something that can kill people unless you don't believe that applies for us today I think that's pretty essential. I believe baptism is absolutely essential. The Bible gives us a teaching on baptism, right? We don't have babies being baptized. And I know I'm going to get, you know, all kinds of people emailing me. I'm not, I'm not here to get into the argument for this particular episode, but let me just make it clear. I think if I read from Genesis to Revelation, I'm going to get a pretty basic view of baptism. I think that's pretty essential. I think it's pretty essential. So, um, you know, so I say it's essential. Others may say it's a non-essential. Who, who gets to make the list? So then you get to come along and say, now, look, brother, look, brother, you, you need, we need unity in the essentials, but we need to show liberty in the non-essentials. Well, you're telling me to show liberty and what you label a non-essential. I think you're out of your mind. I think that's an essential. So yeah, I, I yeah, it just people, uh, Christian programs just throw out that little saying like it's like it's like it was handed down from the throne of God. All right. Let me read the little saying again. In essentials, unity and non-essentials, liberty and all things, charity. Yeah. And, they, and sometimes we act like that. That literally is found, you know, in, in the Bible, like it's found in Scripture. It's a scriptural mandate. And, and it's not. Now, of course, this has nothing to do with Ezra. This has nothing to do with understanding Bible difficulties, but they brought it up. All right. And I could not, 
I, I couldn't resist. I have to talk. I just, and it's just interesting that that was brought up today on that broadcast when I got an email this morning dealing with this very subject. It's a long email. goes into an entire argument against that concept. It's kind of interesting, so we may have to do a program on that as well. There's always... I don't have enough time. Uh, I, I could... Uh, we could move a 24-hour day to a 300 hour day and I still wouldn't have enough time in a 300 hour day to hit the go live button and talk about all the things there are to talk about on a daily basis. I, I really, really, I, I, I don't know how people don't, I mean, I, I, I can never run out of material because there's always so much around us, but let, let's get back to this. I know we kind of just way, way, you know, I just ran the car off the road and we left the road, but it's their fault. Okay. It's not my fault. They brought it up. All right, they brought so just make sure you realize that. All right, let's jump back in and see what they have to say. And dearly, I mean, there are things in the scriptures that really do feel like they rise to such a level of importance that we can't get there without those things. Yeah, right. but there are other things that we sometimes push to that level that don't deserve that much mm-hmm. value. If we really don't find what is most important and by which everything else needs to be compared, it's very easy for us to build a house of cards. That's right. Out of our theology, you know, we're and afraid for, if we yeah. take anything away, the whole thing's going to come down. And all of a sudden, how we are presenting our God and how we are presenting the good news of Jesus sounds uncredible. Yeah. yeah. Because they're seeing the holes in our thinking that we refuse to acknowledge. And that's where community can help. Yes, and we help each other around the table (laughs) all the time on this because we need each other. This all, I think, really comes front and center as we continue to wrestle with this test case passage that we've been looking at from Ezra chapter 10 because we've been struggling with the idea, how do we read Old Testament passages under the rubric of all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable? And... Both sides of that can sometimes be a little bothersome. Why did God inspire this? And how in the world can this be profitable, right? What have we seen as the context for Ezra 10, 1 through 5? People have been in exile, mm-hmm. and they're coming back mm-hmm. to Jerusalem mm-hmm. with a vision to rebuild their temple, their city, their mm-hmm. walls, and to come back under the influence and worship of their God. Yeah. And they're realizing in this gathering that... They've Mm -hmm. made some choices to intermarry, and it's an issue of spiritual impurity. Their other gods have been Mm -hmm. introduced. Yeah, it's important, that distinction, Lisa, because we saw yesterday that the things in Moses' law about intermarriage were not an issue of ethnicity. It was an issue of whose god are you going to worship and the idolatry that foreign wives or husbands could bring into a marriage situation. So it was really more about God than it was about marriage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. it was actually yeah. God offering spiritual protection yeah. to them. And they had violated that. And so, Mark, this time, would you read to us verse 2 and 3 of okay. Ezra chapter 10? Okay, then Shechaniah, son of Jehiel, the descendant of Elam, said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God, for we have married these pagan women of the land. But in spite of this, there's hope for Israel. Let us now make a covenant with our God to divorce our pagan wives and to send them away with their children. And we will follow the advice given by you and by the others who respect the commands of our God. Let it be done according to the law of God. Now that last part is part we saw yesterday that when we read a text like this, the first thing we remember is that they were under a covenant of law, and we are not. We're Mm -hmm. under a covenant of grace, and that changes how we view a text like this and how we apply it or don't apply it in that sense. Today, I want us to look at another handhold that we can get to work our way through difficult passages, and that is something we've talked about in other contexts before. But it's a really, really big idea, and that is that sometimes the Bible is prescriptive, And sometimes the Bible is descriptive. Hmm. Now, think that through a little bit out loud together. Yeah. Well, descriptive means it's describing 
a moment that happened. For instance, they're having this meeting and Shechaniah is wrestling with what to do and he comes up with this idea. And so mm-hmm. in the book of Ezra, this is described, this mm-hmm. scenario is mm-hmm. described, but it doesn't mean we have to do it. Right. Yeah. That's part of the description is this was not necessarily something that God was commanding. This was a solution to a problem that they had worked out and decided this is what we're going to do because yeah. they're trying to fix something yeah. that they've broken. And so in contrast to that, there's prescriptive, which is like a prescription that a doctor writes that you have to take or that you should take where it tells you what to do. So, And what would be an example of that, Bill, in scripture? I would think a prescriptive type thing would be Uh, You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. That is something that we need to react with and respond to. Those commands are to love the Lord your God with all of your heart in light of the fact, look what your God has done for you. Yeah, Yeah, we love him because he first loved us. Yeah, right. Exactly right. There's always the caveat that anytime there's an instruction given in the Bible, we can't do it unless he helps us. (laughs) But you're exactly right. So when we look at a text like this, we can ask ourselves, okay, is this a text where the Bible is describing something that happened Mm -hmm. or is it telling us what to do? Which does this land under? It looks to me like it's descriptive. Yeah. Especially for us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got another question. Uh Yeah. You got another question. Is this what God wanted them to do at that moment? You know, or was the law going to be adapted given their circumstances? as was often done in the Old Testament. Yeah. From time yeah. to time, yeah. the law itself would be adapted as to its... Right. That's why you had the Talmud and the Midrash yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Those were commentaries on what that law... All right, now let me jump in here because this is this is a very important discussion they are having, okay? Very important. I am complete agreement, and every Christian should be in complete agreement with this idea that there are times in the Bible that a passage is descriptive. It's only describing what occurred... It's not prescribing anything we are to do. I completely agree with that. So we always have to determine, is a passage prescriptive or descriptive? 1,000% agree. But let me make this very clear. That doesn't always resolve the difficulty with a text. I can read in the Old Testament where God calls for basically genocide, go in, kill everyone, man, woman, boy, girl, everything, animals, just destroy everything. I may be able to go, well, listen, that's not prescriptive. That's descriptive. Don't you feel better? No, you still have to go, wait a minute. Why did God call for genocide and support genocide in the killing of everyone? Why did God say, hey, go in, kill all the men and you can take the women? Wait, wait, how do I understand that? There's all kinds of things in the Old Testament. Just saying it's not prescriptive, it's simply descriptive, doesn't always fix the situation. Now, if it's a, now this is very important, if it's a situation where someone in the Bible does something wrong, the Bible doesn't offer a condemnation of the act, then we may say, well, that's only describing it. It's not really saying that this was right. It's not even telling us it's wrong. It's just simply describing it. Okay, that may be because then we, then God is not involved in the situation. We're not saying that God Uh, you know, uh, called for it, that he agreed with it. We're just saying that it occurred. So in the Ezra 10 case, they come up with this idea to put away the wives. All right. Now, descriptive. Yes, I agree. It's not prescriptive. It has nothing to do with us. I agree. Completely agree. But here's still the question. Did God support it? Was God okay with it? Now, we can argue from Ezra 10, 3, that that the the one giving the advice, Shechaniah, son of Jehel, is doing this on behalf of Ezra. Ezra is in agreement with this, and this is the idea that they came up with. This is their solution. God had nothing to do with it, and if we read the rest of Ezra 10, and we don't have God approving of this or stepping in, then we could possibly say that their solution was wrong. Now, if we say their solution was wrong, then we have to reinterpret the way we read Ezra 10. When they're weeping and confessing, and we 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 ultimately, if we if we interpret this text that what their their solution was actually wrong, if we interpret the text that way, then we call into question the genuineness of their repentance, or we say they were genuinely repentant. However, they sinned, and their solution to the problem, it's still going to dramatically 
affect how we read that passage and dramatically affect how we preach that passage. So, yes, prescriptive and descriptive is a great concept, and every Christian should know it. Every Christian should know how to utilize it. But just make sure you realize that doesn't always resolve the problem with the text. Hey, God tells them to go in and kill everyone. Okay, it's descriptive. All right, it's not prescriptive. Well, great. Thank you. That's good. So we don't have any crazy people thinking we should go kill uh, individuals. All right. Yes, got it. But wait a minute. God called for that. Why? How do we understand that? How do we justify that? How, how, what do we do with that? So I just want to make sure it's very clear. This is a great principle, but it doesn't always resolve the problem. All right. If, if not, it, here's, the, here's, some, here's how I'll put it. This is a great tool. But sometimes the tool is used to avoid answering the really difficult questions, all right? It can be a tool of avoidance instead of a tool to seek truth and understanding, all right? I, I want you to understand. It's a great tool. It's a great tool. You should use it, prescriptive or descriptive. Learn when you read a passage to know how to identify that. But make sure if you go with the descriptive answer, you don't then just avoid the difficult questions still raised by the text. And as written, we still have to determine if what they did was right or was it wrong. Was it wrong? Then God didn't approve of it. God didn't approve of it. It was wrong. All right, I got to re I got to look at their whole repentant thing. I have to kind of look at their repentant thing as a sad thing. They were broken, they were upset, and then they turned around and committed a horrible evil to fix their sin. Yeah, that, that, that's a whole different way of applying that text. That's a whole different conclusion you would come to in, in the preaching of that text. All right, let, let's let them finish. They're almost done. Here we go. Was to be applied yeah. with. And maybe a good example of that is like with uh, Hosea, who the law would say, don't marry a woman who has cheated on you. Yeah. And God says, I want you to go marry that woman that cheated on you. Yeah. And even at that, it's still describing what happened. It doesn't mean that's what we should do. Right, yeah. Another exactly. example would be that the Old Testament Mosaic Law is full of sacrificial system ritual and regulations. Do all these sacrifices. Well, once the temple was destroyed and the people were exiled to Babylon, they could no longer do that. So yeah. now the prophets would say, you know, God isn't requiring that of you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And even today, they don't do that. No. Orthodox Jews today don't have a temple. And they don't have an altar and they don't offer yeah. sacrifices. They meet in synagogues yeah. and have recrafted worship. Right. Because even though they're still under Moses' law, they're implementing the intent of that law in a right. different way. As we read the scriptures and we come across a passage, we have to ask ourselves, is this telling us what to do or is this just telling us what's happened? And sometimes it can be very obvious and sometimes we have to wrestle with it a little bit. But when we come to a difficult text, it becomes one of those handrails that can help us work our way through it so that we can get from the all scripture is inspired and profitable to how is it profitable. Yeah, It's profitable because it's describing something that is important for us to know. And we'll see why it's important for us to know it as we get later into the week. Yeah, an important thought for us to keep in the back of our minds as we continue this study, because Ezra chapter 10 is. All right, I got to jump in right here. I mean, the program is over, so we don't really need to listen to the end because I really want to drive a point home here. They just talked about, you know, how, what do, how, do, how is this text profitable? We're going to see this as we get later into the week. I want you to write this down. 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 This is very important, all right? As we go later into the week, Thursday and Friday, listening to the Discover the Word podcast, I am going to be, I am absolutely super interested and excited to hear what they're going to do with this text. If they're going to show us how this text is profitable, now this is important, that means they're going to try to apply it. What can we learn from it? What can we take from Ezra chapter 10? I want you to listen to see if their application is consistent with what they have done with the text. What they've basically done with the text is this. This is a descriptive passage. These guys came up with this solution, 
And it's been almost implied that their solution wasn't right. Right. In fact, the name, I think of Tuesday's broadcast, I think the name of their episode was two wrongs don't make a right. So that, that tells you their thinking. Hey, what they did was wrong. Now, if that is the case, if that is the case, then what, how do we apply the text? Well, you're not, you're not left with a lot of applications that will be consistent with your interpretation. About the only application you're going to be consistent is this application number one. When we sin, right? Sin creates situations that are difficult to fix. No, application number two, when we sin, it is important that we do not commit another sin in the response to our first sin. How we respond to our sin is as just as important as our repentance from it. We commit a sin. We don't want to turn around and commit three, four, five, six additional sins because of the first one. So in their particular case, if, listen to me carefully, if, what they, if their solution was wrong, then that then the you can't come back and try to offer some great you know look at how wonderful they repented no they turned around and committed evil and supposedly repenting from their sin we can't we can't repent of a sin by committing another another sin so so you don't have a lot of good op- applications application number 1 sin creates situations that are difficult to resolve uh, application number 2 when we sin we cannot commit an additional sin in responding to the first sin. That those would be some of the most powerful lessons that we could gain from this. There, there's not a lot of way. I'm going to be interested to see if they try to spin this into, look, this text te- teaches us the power of repentance. And this text teaches us being faithful to God. I wonder if they try to spin it in a positive way. Their interpretation has basically said, hey, what they've done, it was it wasn't right it wasn't good okay then that we have to learn from their mistake that would be the power of this passage is to learn from their failed repentance to learn from their failed solution i think that would be but it'll be interesting i i'm fascinated i can't wait I can't wait until I get the notification on one of my podcast uh, apps telling me that the new episode is available because as soon as, I mean, it'll be available probably eight, nine o'clock tonight. I cannot wait because as soon as they drop that, the next episode, I want to hear what they do. Yes. How is this profitable? Yeah, this text, but you're, I might make this very clear. Your application must be consistent with your interpretation. Your application must be, you can't come up with an application that completely ignores the, your interpretation of the text. They've interpreted the text to say, hey, this wasn't God's solution. This was their solution. And they've basically implied that their solution was wrong. And they've basically uh, basically have said that this is just a de- descriptive passage. It's not prescribing anything. Okay, fine. We can still apply some things, but if we apply the lessons here, what, what, what positive lessons do we get in? I mean, we have warnings here. We have warnings. Hey, your sin can create situations that are almost impossible to resolve. Right? And now we could apply that to marriage, divorce, and remarriage. That creates some very difficult situations. And how do we fix those? Okay, We could, we could drive that point really home, make a lot of people uncomfortable. I doubt they're going to go anywhere near that on Discover the Word podcast because they'd probably lose half of their audience. Okay, I understand that, I, but it, it, it's a topic that has to be raised. And number two, hey, when, when you sin, yes, you want to be repentant, you want to confess it, but how you handle what you do after is just as important because you don't want to commit... A, sins trying to fix your first sin. And you know, what other lessons can we gain from the text? Now, I they they their application may be 100% consistent with their interpretation. It may be. I I'm not saying it's not going to be, but I'm fascinated to see what they're going to do. How are they going to demonstrate how profitable this text is Thursday and Friday? I, I, I want, I cannot wait, but you write it down. You write down, pay attention. This is what, you know, pay attention to how they apply this text of scripture. And, 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 and is it going to be consistent? Is it going to be consistent with their interpretation? All right. So basically application must be consistent with interpretation. That's the lesson I really want to drive home. But 
Just to be fair, I know that their, their program is basically over, but we'll let we'll at least let it finish out since we're listening to their program and we're using it to, to build our discussion. They're going to have their little commercial at the end. Let's let them have their little commercial because it's, it's only fair. All right, here we go. It's included in the Bible for a reason. It's no accident. And I think that reason will become clearer as we continue to wrestle with this difficult passage this week. You're at the table with Marty Hahn, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day here on Discover the Word. Well, I think you probably heard me say this often, but uh, while Mart and Elisa and Bill and Daniel get together in person, we also always reserve an extra chair at the table for you. And uh, we are able to welcome people from really all around the world to these daily small group Bible studies because friends like you give voluntary donations. So if you'd like to support the ministry of Discover the Word, you can make a one-time donation or you can sign up to give an automatic monthly gift as a Discover the Word partner. Simply click on the Donate button when you go online to discovertheword.org. And while you're online, take a moment to check out an excellent book from Dr. Paul Brand and Philip Yancey called Fearfully and Wonderfully, The Marvel of Bearing God's Image. Now, the human body holds endlessly fascinating secrets. And in this book, you'll take a remarkable journey through the inner space of our bodies, discovering eternal truths revealed by our seemingly ordinary existence. Now, Philip Yancey will be here with us next week. And so, in anticipation of that visit, look for the book Fearfully and Wonderfully when you go online to discovertheword.org. Well, you know, for thousands of years, the Israelites lived under the law. And so, how should we read and interpret Bible stories that took place under that old covenant? Well, I'm Brian Hedinga, inviting you to join Mark, Elisa, Bill, and Daniel again tomorrow to talk more about how the Old Testament applies to those that are living under the new covenant. I'll save you a seat right here Thursday when we discover the word. Please know discover Thursday. The word is provided oh, by our daily bread ministries. Okay, now I can talk. I was so rudely interrupted there. So on Thursday, it's going to be application. That's going to be the focus. So I told you to write it out. Write it down. Is their application consistent with their interpretation? Monday and Tuesday, they basically gave their interpretation. Today, they didn't really give much interpretation. They were kind of just talking a lot of random topics. They didn't really, other than they wanted to bring in that principle, you know, uh, descriptive versus prescriptive, which I talk about all the time in my preaching. But just remember, that doesn't always, that doesn't always resolve the difficulty. So they didn't really give us much of an interpretation today other than saying that the passage is just descriptive. But come tomorrow, when they start applying this, man, I want to know. If you listen, You, I want you to listen carefully to, to when we play the episode tomorrow. Or you can just go subscribe to the Discover the Word podcast and listen to it tonight when it drops. I'm going to be listening. I'm going to be looking for it because I can't wait. Um, because I want to hear, okay, here comes the application. Here comes... Oh, yes, yes. Oh, no, that has nothing to do with the way you interpreted the text. In fact, if it completely contradicts their interpretation of the text, I, I'm then I, I'm just going to lay on the floor and start crying like a baby because that drives me crazy when you do all this work to try to get a right interpretation. And then you get to the application phase. You literally like ignore what you interpreted. And, and pastors, do, oh, all pastors, we are all guilty of this. Sometimes you want, you, you preach a text and then you're like, okay, 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 okay. You know, uh, you can kind of look out in the audience and you're like, ah, they're not really paying attention. They don't really seem to care. And you're like, okay, I got to drive this point. I got to drive a point home. And you come up with some application that you really want to drive home to get everyone's attention. And then when you go home and listen to the sermon, you're like, oh man, that may be that may be a good principle that I gave. That may be a good truth that I gave, but that doesn't. That's not really a good application of that scripture. I should have brought. I mean, I I basically started preaching a separate sermon. I started. I, I wanted to drive this point home, and I used this text. Uh, I I tried to uh, I tried to use this point as an application to this text, but really it has nothing to do with that text of scripture. Now the the idea may be biblical. But it doesn't matter if the idea is biblical if you're applying it to a text that doesn't support it by your interpretation. Right? Those are, that's a very important thing to listen to. And, 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 and as pastors, we, you've got this pressure that you've got to drive, the, you've got to give the people something practical. And sometimes you have a text that there may not be any really great, you know, 
you know, uh, how can you say it, you know, um, exciting application. And sometimes you just kind of, there's not really a good application and, and, but you feel that pressure. You got to give something, some got to give the people something practical. And so you end up coming up with an application that has nothing to do with the text of scripture before you, or the text of scripture you just expounded and interpreted. And uh, now that's you, you listen, uh, people who listen to sermons and listen to Christian radio, you've got to learn to catch that. So tomorrow could be a good exercise in this. So we will see if they are consistent. All right, that right, we'll stop right there. That concludes this episode of the Theology Central podcast, understanding Bible difficulties, um, understanding difficult Bible passages. This is part four. You can go back and listen to all the previous episodes. If you need help finding them, email me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. I have been working over the last 24 hours to ensure that this podcast, as, as along with all of our other podcasts, that they are available on every podcast platform and app in existence. I, I Right now on my iPad, I have the Breaker podcast app. I have a Pocket Cast, uh, the Pocket Cast um, uh, podcast app. I have the Himalaya podcast app. I have the CastBox uh, podcast app. I have the Stitcher podcast app. And I have the Overcast podcast app. And I have the Sermon.net podcast app. And I have the Spreaker podcast app. I have all of those apps currently on my iPad, um, seeing how how the different ones work. But I have ensured that our podcasts are available on all of those. If you use a podcast app and we are currently not on that app, all you need to do is email me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, and I will do everything in my power legally to make sure that our podcasts are available on whatever podcast app you prefer. You tell me the one you prefer, I'll try to find a way to make sure our podcast is available. And also remember, in many podcast uh, apps, even if it's not available, you can add it yourself by adding the podcast URL or the podcast RSS feed. If you need that a link, email me. I can send it. To, tell me which podcast and I can send it to you. First, you can tell me which podcast app you're using, and I'll try to get it added myself. But if I can't, I can send you the URL, and then you can have it added to whichever podcast app. We, I know we're available on, I mean, we're available on, I mean, everything from Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, um, uh, Deezer, the music streaming service, iHeartRadio. I mean, man, there's so, I can't even keep up with all of them. Uh, podcast Addict, um, I don't even remember. There's just so many, uh, but we're trying to ensure that if you want to listen, you can. So let me know what you need and I will and, and do what I can to help you find us. All right. I'll stop right there. We talked about a lot of things. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you're getting some, 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 some important information and getting some important lessons on how to understand a difficult Bible passage. All right. God bless you.